Welcome to the Red Mage 1 to 90 leveling skills guide. In this guide, we'll cover all of your skills as you train to love roses more than Waluigi, better than the rest of them, but also hopefully kill your enemies along the way. Watch as you go from this. to this. This series is framed in the mindset of players completely new to Final Fantasy XIV, or the MMO genre in general, or generally just still inexperienced. In that same vein, this will merely be an overview of the actions and how to use them. Optimal rotations are better left to their own in-depth videos just due to how much complexity is involved in perfect openers and overall rotations. This is not meant to be a purely optimal guide. If you wish to be optimal at level cap, there are further places you could research your job on. We will, however, be crafting rotations as we go to help new players understand what goes through creating openers and give them a foothold to be able to push themselves into being able to do it on their own. The goal is to drop players in on the ground level so they can make strides to improve themselves. All tooltips will be shown at the level cap for each section. Level 50 for Realm Reborn, Level 60 for Heaven's Word skills, Level 70 for Stormblood stuff, level 80 for Shadowbringers levels, and level 90 for Endwalker. I also recommend all players add Sprint and Limit Break to their hotbars, both found in the general tab of your actions menu. And as for how my hotbars build, it'll make sense at 90. Just put skills on your hotbars in a way you feel comfortable using as you're leveling. Everyone has their own way of doing things. If you want more info on how I set up my UI, check the description or the card in the corner for a video on it. And keep the following in mind, Patches can change jobs still. Be sure to check the description for any patch notes for minor potency changes or skill changes or any other special notes. With all that out of the way, let's begin. Red Mage is the definition of style and flexibility. Plenty of movement, good damage, some very important utility for when emergencies happen, and the only mage to constantly need to be in melee for their attacks. Not that other mages should be far away anyway. But Red Mage is in and out all the time. You have an entire melee combo that is required to access your massive finishing spells. Generally considered to be an easier DPS job to learn, it has a few tricks that some people tend to miss when they are unable to understand it. Mostly due to Red Mage's dual cast, the main feature of their spell slinging and why they are able to get in for melee attacking. Once you get into the flow, it feels smoother and one of the easiest to handle. To obtain the Red Mage job, you must complete your level 10 class quest and be level 50. That's it. Aside from owning the Stormblood expansion, that is. Have these requirements met? Head to the Old Dawn Market area, Sapphire Avenue Exchange. Near the town exit will be the Red Mage quest. Before going forward, let's mention you have an entire set of role actions. Each of these have their own uses and such, but will not be gone over here. Linked in the corner or down in the description is a guide focused on just these role actions. They're a recommended thing you should check out. Put these on your hotbar. Let's get into the finer details of each skill. Red Mage starts at level 50, so we have a lot of buttons in our starting toolkit to talk over. Level 20, Maim and Mend, and level 40, Maim and Mend 2. These exist only because of how a Realm Reborn is balanced. They're just passive boosts to attacking and healing powers, 10% and 30% for them, but it doesn't really do anything for us. Level 1, Dual Cast. This is an extremely important skill, to the point it's going to be sitting in the corner for the next while just to emphasize its importance. Upon casting any of your spells, you will gain a buff for 15 seconds called Dual Cast. Dual Cast will remove the next spell's cast time, then disappear. Using any skills that are not abilities while dual cast is active will have you lose the dual cast. Not all of them are spells. Because of this, Red Mage is all about casting spells in twos. Cast the first spell, immediately cast the second. Your toolkit is also based around this interaction. Some spells have short cast times, while others have very long cast times. This needs to be emphasized a lot. We'll do that starting out with the first set of skills. But first let me mention to keep in mind for the rest of the video, dual cast makes for really strong weaving windows, that being places where you can use abilities between spells. Always try to fit your abilities in after dual cast. We'll see this a lot in the video as we go on. Further, you need to actively cast the spell to get dual cast. Swift casted spells will not grant dual cast. 
level 2, Jolt, level 4, for Thunder, and level 10, for Arrow. Starting with Jolt, we have a 2 second cast time, 200 MP cost, and does 170 potency of damage to a target. It also increases our black and white mana by 2, mana being our gauge here. I'll talk about this later in its own section, just don't be confused between MP and mana, they're different things in this case. Anyway, this is a basic spell you can cast, but becomes more important when we look at the other two skills. For Thunder and for Arrow are both 5 second cast times, cost 300 MP, and deal 300 potency of damage. Both increase your mana by 6, but for Thunder is for black mana and for Arrow white mana. This is where dual cast comes into play. For Thunder and for Arrow are so much stronger, but have such long cast times that they become weaker than Jolt. But if we dual cast them, the cast times become quote unquote instant. Cast Jolt to get the dual cast buff, then cast for Thunder or for Arrow to instantly send the spell out. Repeat this over and over. We're alternating short cast time spells to get dual cast, then long cast time spells to spend it. This is the core loop of Red Mage that makes it fairly easy to play. But of course, it's not that simple. There's plenty of things to complicate matters, including the final part of Ver Thunder and Ver Arrow. There is a 50% chance you will gain a 30 second buff. Ver Thunder can give you Ver Fire ready, and Ver Arrow gives Ver Stone ready. These are known as procs, or when one skill activates another. So let's see what these procs do for you. Level 26 for fire, and level 30 for stone. These have a 2 second cast time and cost 200 MP. They do 260 potency of damage to a target, increasing black or white mana by 5. They can only be used when you get your ready procs from for thunder and for arrow. Look again at that cast time. They have the same cast time as jolt, but are far stronger. 90 potency specifically. These, when you have them, replace Jolt in your rotation. They're stronger, they give more mana in total, and are a resource you can be spending. Instead of using Jolt to proc dual cast, you will ver fire and ver stone to proc dual cast, then use ver thunder and ver arrow. This leads to some management on your part to keep your gauge going and to manage your procs. If you currently have a dual cast proc and currently have a ver fire proc, you will only want to use Ver Arrow just to get the Ver Stone proc, and not overwrite that Ver Fire proc. Yes, this is a situation that happens, so be warned, do not overwrite a proc if you can help it. Now let's talk about gauge management, since I've mentioned it. While casting spells, you'll be gaining black and white mana, slowly but surely. If you reach 50 mana in both black and white, the gauge and crystal at the top will turn red. This is a good thing we'll mention in a moment. However, if the gap between black and white mana becomes 30 or more, for example, 50 mana of one color and 20 of the other, the crystal at the top will turn the color of the mana you have too much of. This signals imbalance. You never want to perfectly balance your mana, for reasons we'll see later, but you don't want to be boosting one color so high you become imbalanced. Stay within a 30 mana gap as you raise both colors up to over 50. If you hit an imbalance, your mana generation for the lower mana level is cut in half, so when it falls behind, it becomes even harder to catch it back up. This need in itself makes it easier to keep our procs managed. For example, if we use a Ver Stone proc, we'll likely use that dual cast on Ver Thunder unless we already have a Ver Fire proc. In that case, we'll Ver Stone into Ver Arrow, then Ver Fire into Ver Thunder to alternate. But overall, currently it's not all too bad to do. While those situations I outlined are good to get used to, it's pretty difficult to imbalance your mana. 30 is a huge gap. Verfire into Ver Thunder is only 11 black mana. You would need to do it three times to imbalance your mana from near perfect balance. Until the end of Stormblood, your highest mana generation is only 7. Though Stormblood skills 11 mana. If you put in even the tiniest amount of effort in balancing your mana, you should be fine. So let's move into our other skills. Level 15, Scatter. Level 18, Ver Thunder 2. And level 22, Ver Arrow 2. While well, the other five skills all were for single target, this is our AoE, Area of Effect, spell set. 
and they work in reverse. Ver Thunder 2 and Ver Aero 2 have a 2 second cast time, cost 400 MP, and deals 100 potency of damage to a target and all enemies within 5 yams of that target. It will also give you 7 mana of a single color. We then move into Scatter, which has a 5 second cast time for 400 MP. It does 120 potency to a target and all enemies within 5 yams of it. We'll talk about acceleration potency in a moment, but both black and white mana are increased by 3. Again, they work backwards. While Scatter is essentially our jolt for AoE, we use that second. It actually takes a bit to get used to personally. Jolt into long cast elemental magic for single target spells, elemental magic into Scatter for AoE. You will want to use your AoE spells when there are 3 or more enemies. One or two enemies, it's safer and easier to just use single target attacks, alternating targets. Three or more enemies, swap to your tier 2 spells and scatter for higher damage. The only exception would be the acceleration potency, but we're getting into min-maxing there. Level 6, Core Core. Level 40, Displacement. And level 40, Engagement. These are both movement and damaging skills. All three work on a charge system. The cooldowns are per charge, and you can store up to two charges. The moment you use one charge, the next charge will begin the cooldown. Core Core is on a 35 second cooldown that works as a gap closer. It launches you at the enemy and does a 130 potency hit. This has a number of great uses. If the party has to stack together and you're far away for any reason, you can rush in immediately. Or maybe the boss put an AoE in your location and you can use it to dodge. But also, be careful of the fact that this is a gap closer as well. Gap closers have animation locks, meaning you can't move or do any other actions until the animation ends. When you hit Core Core, you're committing to it. While you generally do not want to be far away from a boss, anytime you are, this Core Core turns that distance into nothing. Being a mage doesn't mean you want to be away, especially when we see the rest of our toolkit. Displacement and engagement, meanwhile, are on a shared 35 second charge time. Using displacement will also spend a use of engagement. This works out okay, since both do 130 potency of damage to a target. However, ultimately engagement is more often the superior ability. Engagement is a very quick animation and can only be used from almost point blank range of 3 yams. You can keep moving for the duration and stay within melee range. Displacement has a slightly further point blank range of 5 yams and launches you backwards 15 yams. This has an animation lock just like Core Core. You cannot cast again until you land. If you can't see why engagement is better, it's because you aren't thrown away from the boss and no animation lock. Distance is not a beneficial thing on its own. You can miss party buffs, heals, be in a bad position for mechanics, or even throw yourself off the edge of an arena, killing yourself. Engagement gives you so much more control of yourself while losing no damage. The only time you want to use displacement is if there is some cause to put distance. A point blank AoE from the boss, some sort of spread mechanic that you want to be away from the other players for. It's a lot more stylish, but much harder to use. You're almost not losing anything if you just keep it off your bars. Otherwise, just make sure to use these when you have openings. It's a free bit of extra damage between spells. Use them on cooldown for the most part, which also describes... Level 45, Flesh. On a short 25 second cooldown, this does 460 potency of damage to a single target. That's a huge amount of damage for a short cooldown. Be sure to send this off every chance you get. It'll be back up in a moment, and do even more damage when you send it off again. It also has no melee range constraints. You can use it from far away like your normal spells. Use it on cooldown. Level 50, Acceleration. On a 55 second cooldown, Acceleration allows you to cast for Thunder, for Arrow, or Scatter instantly instead of the 5 second cast time. This buff lasts for 20 seconds, but you'll almost exclusively use it instantly. Essentially, this works as a free dual cast, but unlike dual cast, or even swift cast, there's further benefits. As we saw with Scatter, there is an acceleration potency of 170. Acceleration, when used for AoE, 
boost Scatter's power by 50 potency. This is a pretty significant boost, making it extremely worth it. Meanwhile, in single target, Acceleration says it increases the 50% chance to activate procs to a guaranteed chance. Every use of Acceleration is a free ver fire or ver stone. This is where that proc management comes in. Let's say mid-fight you jolt into ver arrow, giving you ver stone ready. You then Acceleration into ver thunder, giving you ver fire. You now have both procs. Meaning any using of procs leads into using the same element to try and re-proc what we just used. Acceleration is extremely key to keeping up the flow of the job. If you are getting poor proc luck, acceleration is your ticket into bigger damage and bigger mana gains. While one extra mana doesn't seem like much, the potency alone adds up fast. And with how long duties are, one mana does add up eventually into something worthwhile. Level 1, Repost. Level 35, Zwisho, and level 50, Redoublement. These are just bad. These are melee weapon skills, a full combo that does an average 170 potency, the same power as Jolt. You must perform them in order to complete the combo. No skipping ahead. They do scale off of magic, so it's not like you're doing strength-based damage like your auto attacks. You do not want to use these. However, there is a fine print at the bottom of each skill. They upgrade when you have at least 15 or 20 of each mana. 20 black and 20 white, from this point forward referred to as 2020 or 1515 and such. Level 1, Enchanted Repost. Level 35, Enchanted show, And level 50, Enchanted Redoublement. This is much better. These are still a combo, so you still want to perform them in order. They are also melee skills, forcing you to be next to the enemy you are using it on. Enchanted Repost is a 220 potency hit, Enchanted Vachot is 290 potency, and Enchanted Redoublement a massive 470 potency hit. These cost 2020, 1515, and 1515 mana each. In total, that is 5050 mana for our whole combo, with an average hit of over 326 potency. But it gets better than that. Enchanted Sword Strikes have a faster cooldown than the normal 2.5 seconds. Their recast is 1.5 seconds, a full second faster per attack, functionally making them stronger than their listed potencies, closer to 450 potency per strike when adjusted for the faster cooldown. This is our goal as Red Mage. We build up mana until we have at least 50-50, then spend all of it on our big melee combo. It's what we will do from now on, all the way up to level 90. This melee finisher will get longer, and getting to it will be easier as we level up and get more tools. But in every rotation, every opener, our goal is to build mana, then unleash our melee combo. If you can do it when under some party buffs, the better. There's a few things to worry about though. As I mentioned, the gauge turns red when you hit 50-50. Anywhere before level 50, you don't have your full combo, the threshold remains 50-50 even back in Sestasha. 40 is when you might want to do a melee combo there, since you can use two Enchanted Repulsts back to back. Further, let me mention again that this is a melee combo. Casting any spell after initiating the combo will cancel the combo entirely. The spent mana will be gone, and you'll have to go back to generating to 50-50. Be ready to commit to a full combo when you begin it, which also means timing your combo to be when the boss isn't about to do a large boss-centered AoE that you have to avoid. Stay close to do your combo when it becomes available, but be careful the boss isn't about to do something that forces you away. So now let's move into talking about openers and how Red Mage doesn't really have much of one at level 50. Level 60 and above, basically all your openers have a similar flow and are based on your melee phase, Doing the same thing for level 50 just doesn't work. I'm going to show you an image that won't make entire sense, but we'll talk about it. Before going into it, I want to also note the legend in the bottom left. I have added a tertiary element for dual cast GCDs, unique to this video. The Thunder, The Arrow, Swift Cast, Acceleration, The Thunder, The Arrow, Flesh, Verfire, Verthunder, Korkor, 
Engagement. Who knows? The arrow. Korakor. Engagement. Um. 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 Uh. Enchanted Repost. Enchanted Zwishou. Enchanted Redoublement. This is the quote unquote opener. It involves not knowing any idea how your rotation will work, because as we discussed, all of our procs are random, except for acceleration, which means getting to our melee phase at the end, we have no idea how it will go. In the entire process of getting to 50-50 mana, you could get every possible proc. You could get zero procs. We just can't know. So let's talk about the things we can know. This first cast is a slow cast. We're supposed to be starting with Jolt, right? Well, not in an opener. In ideal scenarios, the tank will give us some sort of countdown so that the long cast time doesn't matter. This is something you'll basically never get outside of high-end content. Outside of it, you need to guess when the tank is going to pull and try to manually time your cast 5 seconds before the boss is pulled. I personally will do this for the pacing of the rotation and comfort. This used to be required for old Red Mage openers, but the current iteration will not punish you severely for making the first Verthunder a jolt. So decide for yourself if you're going to go for the long cast or just relegating yourself to the whims of the tank. If you do get a countdown, do Verthunder. Hit the button when the giant five appears on screen. Regardless of what we do, we can then ver arrow. This may or may not give us procs. Then we can double weave swift cast and acceleration which gives us two instant casts in a row. We can spend these on another Ver Thunder and Ver Arrow. Acceleration takes priority here, guaranteeing us a Ver Fire cast. We have another weaving window for some of our OGCD attacks, so we flesh with how strong it is to get it out first. We can use it even earlier, but we do want to develop some muscle memory for the proper opener. Then for any further weaving windows we get, we weave both Core Core and Engagement together. This is a further benefit to the short animation of engagement we didn't see earlier. And then, yeah, we don't really know the rest. We just keep going until we have 50-50 mana. Use stuff on cooldown in the meantime, and use your melee combo when you can. Level 50 is more about understanding how Red Mage works as a concept. We don't get any cool proper openers till 60, so we'll save any further discussion on them until then. And that includes any karaoke openers. Doing one here would waste both of our times, so let's just move into Heaven's Word skills. Level 52, Molinet and Enchanted Molinet. So very conspicuous was the lack of an AoE use for mana. The basic Molinet is worthless, while Enchanted version is great. This has the same 1.5 second recast as your other Enchanted melee skills. It costs 20-20 mana to use and deals 130 potency to all enemies in an 8 yom cone in the direction of your current target. Anytime you have 20-20 mana in AoE, three or more targets, you can pop this off for major damage. This is stronger than even Scatter with the Acceleration buff, though use that before going into your AoE if you can. Further, you may also want to try and get used to the idea of using Molinet when you have 60-60 mana and no less. This is going to be extremely important later, but it allows you to do three enchanted Molinets in a row. Otherwise, this is simply just an AoE mana spender. Level 54, The Cure. Please don't fall into the trap that this can lead to. With a 2 second cast time and costing 500 mana, this heals the target for 350 potency of healing. It can be used on anyone. Unlike Summoner, this isn't complete trash. This is a real heal on a DPS job. A damage per second job. A heal that doesn't do damage. I, as a healer, in many cases will purposefully leave my allies low on HP for a bit because no mechanics are coming out, and my giant heal of big healing is about to come off of cooldown. Many of you red mages panic and start to spam Vakir on yourself, or you will be missing less than 20% of your health and Vakir yourself back to max. This is not how you should be using this. The cure is for solo and for absolute emergencies such as the healer died. It's more expensive than your AoE attacks even, and for as good as it is, it's still worse than a healer's worst healing skill. 
The penalty for death isn't this gigantic thing in your average content, so unless you are absolutely 10,000% certain the healer is gonna let you die, just let them heal. If they let you die purely from lack of healing, not because you stood in an AoE, just hold off on spamming Vakir like you were planning to. Vakir can be good. It can be very useful and even save runs. There is a time and a place for it, but you're a DPS. A low HP DPS and a max HP DPS do the same damage. It's the dead DPS that does zero damage. If you're going to die for sure, use Vakir. But if you're 10 minutes into a dungeon and you haven't been let down, you haven't died yet, maybe hold on a bit more. I don't want to spend too much time on that because Vakir has some really fun tech you can use it for. Consider the following. Bosses that leave the arena for ultimates or have short invincibility phases like Ifrit. While you are unable to attack the boss or other enemies, use Vakir. You can use it for healing, sure, but what I want to highlight is the dual cast you get. That's right, Vakir procs dual cast. Right before ad spawn or the boss comes back to fight, you can Vakir to immediately throw out a Thunder or a arrow for extra damage and mana. Adds a huge element of flexibility to what you can do mid fight. You might get an extra proc out of it without even needing to use acceleration. This is an extremely small thing, borderline min maxing, but I find it extremely fun to do, especially in bosses that give you a lot of windows for it. Level 56, Contra 6. On a 45 second cooldown, this does 360 potency of damage to a target and all enemies within 6 yarms of it. This is your AoE version of Flesh essentially. It's not as strong in single target, but the AoE power is nothing to sneeze at. You should already be using stuff like Flesh and AoE still, but now they take a back seat next to Contra 6. Get this out on as many enemies as you can, but also don't shy away from it on single target either. In bosses, you're still going to be using this. Level 58, Embolden. On a 2 minute cooldown, this increases your magic damage by 5% for 20 seconds. Additionally, all allies within 15 yarms of yourself will also gain a 5% damage increase. Another reason to be in melee range, you and your allies are all starting to buff each other. Ideally, everyone will be throwing these all off at similar times, multiplying the effectiveness. We'll be slotting this into our opener for this purpose. Don't ignore this in trash either. Trash is more dangerous than bosses, so this makes for a perfect excuse to make your Molinades do even more damage, or whatever the rest of your party is doing. Keep using this so you can do bigger bursts and kill faster. Level 60, Manification. This is one of two skills that are locked by your job quests. If you have not been doing your job quests, you better get catching up. And then keep going to level 70. Anyway, having a 120 second cooldown, Manification will instantly increase your mana by 50-50. That's an entire melee combo alone. However, to prevent abuse, you can only use this inside of combat. After your initial hit or two, you can jump right into your melee phase with this. Don't forget to pop this off in AoE too. This is only 50-50 though, and I still say you should do 60-60 for AoE for Triple Molin A, but this gets you almost all the way there. Further, because Magnification and Embolden are both 2 minute cooldowns, you can use them together. You're guaranteed melee attacks, which are your biggest hits, especially later on. So buff yourself up at the same time as Magnification, and you're getting guaranteed bonuses. So now we move on to the opener talk, and putting together a real opener, one that will serve us mostly to level 90. But we do have a couple very important things with further levels. But basically the entire thing revolves around manification and the melee phase that gives us. The Thunder, the Arrow, Swift Cast, Acceleration, the Thunder, the Thunder, Embolden, Manification, Enchanted Repost, Flesh, Enchanted Vachot, Country Sixth, Enchanted Redoublement, Core Core, Engagement, The Fire, The Arrow, Core Core, Engagement. Once again, if you can't get for Thunder to open, do Jolt instead. But then we do the Swift Cast and Acceleration still. We do two for Thunders in a row. This is guaranteed to give us a proc with the first one 
So why do a second for Thunder instead of for Arrow? We answer that at level 70. Come back then. Otherwise, things are pretty self-explanatory. Embolden and Magnification to get us a powered melee phase as we discussed. Use our OGCDs from strongest to weakest as we continue on. And then a Verfire into for Arrow at the end because of the guaranteed Verfire proc. And to prevent our mana from becoming imbalanced. From there, we may or may not be getting procs, and we're down to just Jolt without any. There's a bit more to add with further expansions, making the opening longer and more beneficial for us. We'll see that as we go on. For now, let's do the karaoke opener. This means I'm going to speak the skill names as they go off. If I hit a button, the name will be said as the skill goes off. This will lead to me overlapping the skill names as I speak, since they're lengthy names and the rotation is fast at points. For Thunder. For Arrow. Swift Cast. Acceleration. For Thunder. For Thunder. Embolden. Modification. Enchanted Repost. Flesh. Enchanted for Show. Country Sixth. Enchanted Redoublement. Core Core. Engagement. For Fire. For Arrow. Core Core. Engagement. Alright, Storm Blood time. We're gonna get a real finisher and some other very important skills now. Level 62. Enhanced Jolt and Jolt 2. Jolt is now Jolt 2, which does 280 potency of damage to a target. All other effects remain the same. This is a massive 110 potency increase, but it's still the skill you want to avoid using at all costs. Remember, procs are better. Further, for Thunder and for Arrow we're buffed to 360 potency, and for Fire and for Stone up to 300 potency. Smaller buffs, but still significant. Level 64, Veraze. A massive 10 second cast time and costing a huge 2400 MP. This raises a player who has died. This is a much more useful skill than Vakir, but also still temper your expectations. Neither you or the healer can afford to spam raises. They're very expensive. MP is limited, even if overall Red Mage won't normally have issues. If something really bad happens, something that damages the whole party majorly and even kills one or more people, you can raise the players who died while the healer takes care of giving everyone some HP back. This is especially important if it was the healer or healers who died, or even the tank. But often healers prioritize raising a tank before healing, even if that isn't the correct decision at the time. I'm less harsh on this one because a weak heal often won't make a difference without spamming when the healer had it under control. A raise is equal no matter who uses it. Let the healer handle it if they're not struggling and it's just like one guy who got themselves killed. But if the healer dies or even just doesn't have swift cast available or some mechanic fails and severely damages the party, get raising for them. An entire party member being alive is worth more than one lost cast. And the healer has enough making sure nobody else dies on top of whatever happened. Which, make sure you dual casting Verays. Do Jolt into Verays. In the time it would take to hard cast Verays, you would get four spell casts. Level 66, Scatter Mastery and Impact. Scatter joins in the upgrades, becoming Impact. This makes the base potency 200, 30 more than the acceleration potency of Scatter. Then the acceleration potency of Impact is 250. That's a huge hit from where we were. Otherwise, everything else remains the same. Make sure you're acceleration impacting more. Level 68, Mana Stack. Our gauge has been expanded. On the bottom are now three diamonds. This is the Mana Stack. Using enchanted skills in a row, regardless of what they are, regardless of if they're in the proper combo order, will fill the mana stack. I say in a row because using any other spell will empty the mana stack. This is why I recommend getting 60-60 mana for AoE. Three Molinades will fill all three diamonds of the mana stack, which allows for the use of our level 68 and 70 skills. So continue to do your full enchanted combo in single target and in AoE situations, enchanted Molinade three times in a row. Level 68, Verflayer. And level 70, Verholy. Verholy is our second job quest skill. Do your quests, get the skill. As for these, upon getting three mana stacks, Verthunder will turn into Verflayer, and Ver Arrow into Verholy. 
These can only be used when you have three mana stacks as a result, and will spend all three. They have the same effects, but black or white magic based, just like the other skills. They both do 580 potency of damage to a target. Then all enemies within 5 yams of the initial target will take 232 potency of damage. This is a massive hit for both single target and AoE. And the best part, there's no cast time, meaning you can continue to move even after your melee combo is finished. Upon hitting the enemy, mana will increase by 11, black or white. Then there is a 20% chance of getting a Verfire or Verstone proc. However, let's say white mana has 5 mana and black mana has 10. Using Verholy will have a guaranteed 100% chance to get Verstone. This is ultimately why you do not want to be perfectly balanced on mana. A slight tiny imbalance of even 1 mana is enough to guarantee you a free proc. Procs are still an economy we want to be using to the best of our ability. These procs are common and extremely useful. They're stronger and lead back into more melee combos, and for flares and for holies. It's not rotation ruining, but it's a benefit we want to abuse. And abuse it we will! Let's look back at the opener and fit in one of these. Ver Thunder. Ver Arrow. Swift Cast. Acceleration. Ver Thunder, Ver Thunder, Embolden, Manification, Enchanted Repost, Flesh, Enchanted's Rechaux, Contra Sixth, Enchanted Redoublement, Core Core, Engagement, Ver Holy, Core Core, Engagement, Ver Fire, Ver Thunder, Ver Stone, Ver Arrow. Before, we did the melee combo into a Ver Fire and Ver Arrow to use our proc and stay balanced. This is no longer an issue thanks to Verholy. Remember, at the start we do two Ver Thunders in a row, getting us pretty imbalanced on mana and potentially wasting a proc. Well, we don't actually waste that proc. We imbalanced our mana with it, meaning Verholy will give us a proc too. We are guaranteed to, after this Verholy, have Verfire and Verstone ready to be used. So we do so, Verfire into Ver Thunder to potentially get another Verfire proc, then sped the Verstone we have for sure. Despite this mostly just slotting in Verholy, there's a few changes that make it worth doing the karaoke opener again, so let's do that quick. Ver Thunder. Ver Arrow. Swift Cast. Acceleration. Ver Thunder. Ver Thunder. Embolden. Magnification. Enchanted Repost. Splash. Enchanted Rochot. Country Sixth. Enchanted Redoublem. Core Core. Engagement. For Holy, Core Core, Engagement, For Fire, For Thunder, For Stone, For Arrow. Now let's buff up our toolkit, and maybe even extend our finisher with Shadowbringers. Level 72, Enhanced Displacement. Despite the name, this improves both displacement and engagement. They are now an improved 180 potency, that's 50 potency improvement on both. Since it's short cooldown and commonly used, this is actually a good boost in damage. Just remember, engagement is the better of the two skills on average. Level 74, Red Magic Mastery. This lowers the Contra 6 cooldown to 35 seconds. It's not a full potency boost, but we get to use it more. But more importantly, for Thunder 2 and for Arrow 2 are up to 120 potency. Remember, 20 potency on every enemy is a much bigger increase than, say, 20 potency on a single target attack. Level 76, Reprise and Enchanted Reprise. Just like everything melee, the base version is just trash. Enchanted Reprise is the version we want, which is why Reprise, when you have 5-5 five, five mana or more, becomes it. This does a ranged attack of 290 potency to a target. This is what we use whenever we have to do so much movement we cannot stop for even two seconds to cast. Attacking while moving is better than not attacking at all. The issue is the cost. You're almost guaranteed to have enough mana to use Enchanted Reprise at all times. And if you're not at 50-50 yet, you can't use your full melee combo. It's not a waste of mana, but it's not the best use. Make sure you absolutely can't pause for two seconds to cast Jolt or Ready procs before hitting Enchanted Reprise. It's very nice for when you really have no other options, 
but make sure you have no other options, like Acceleration or Swift Cast. Level 78, Enhanced Manification. Manification has been reduced to a 110 second cooldown, which doesn't do much of anything for us. The uses of that 10 second window are pretty high level, mostly for getting two melee phases in a row. More importantly is a new additional effect. You gain five stacks of Manification for 15 seconds. This increases the magic damage of the next five attacks you do by 5%, spending the stacks with each attack. This means all three enchanted melee attacks, your Verflayer or Verholy, and one more attack get boosted. For AoE, make sure you are at 1010 mana before hitting Manification. If lower than 1010, you will spend one or more stacks on your non-burst phase, and you definitely want to be buffing your finisher because... Level 80, Scorch. After using Verflare or Verholy, Jolt and Impact will become Scorch. This is a double finisher, doing 680 potency to a target, and a 5 yarm AoE doing 272 potency of damage to all targets in range. You also gain 4 black and white mana. If you're already in a situation where you're using Verflare or Verholy, you're using Scorch. And this is why we want to have 10-10 mana before hitting Manification for AoE. If you use even one stack of Manification before starting your melee combo, you will not be able to buff Scorch. So be careful with that, and otherwise again, this is a simple use. And it's a simple insert to our opener. Slot in Scorch after Verholy. Everything else remains the same otherwise, to the point there's no reason to do an overview of the opener. We covered this opener plenty at 70, and any other need to discuss it happens at 90. Which, yeah, let's just move on. Let's go right into the Endwalker skill set. Level 82, Red Magic Mastery 2, Ver Thunder 3, and Ver Arrow 3. Ver Thunder and Ver Arrow are upgraded automatically into Ver Thunder 3 and Ver Arrow 3. These are small 20 potency increases. It's not all that big, but it's pretty nice animation wise. Level 84, Red Magic Mastery 3. More mastery! Ver Thunder 2 and Ver Arrow 2 get another 20 potency increase to 140 potency. For Fire and for Stone are now up to 330 potency, Jolt 2 is 310, Impact is 210, which makes Acceleration potency 260. And Enchanted Reprise is 330 potency. Lots of potencies, no gameplay changes. Level 86, Magic Barrier. On a 2 minute cooldown, sends out a large bubble of protection that buffs any ally who is hit by it. It has a 15 yom range and will reduce magic damage taken by everyone affected by 10%. HP recovery is also increased by 5%, helping your healers top everyone back up. Most of all raid-wide damage in the game is magical. Little to none is physical, and dark damage is dark arts. Point is, most things that will unavoidably harm the entire party will be reduced in power by magic barrier. And since you're already standing close to the boss for Embolden, your melee attacks, and so on, you can hit most if not all your allies with this easily. Now, most enemies in dungeon trash pools use physical auto attacks, but there's some magical auto attacking enemies. But more importantly, 5% extra healing. You can pop off magic barrier in the middle of a trash pool to help the healer keep pace with the tank's draining HP. It's not a huge boost, but it can make the difference for those 10 seconds. Magical enemies just further improves magic barrier in trash pools. Get used to timing some extra defensive measures. Hopefully by now you've been used to using Addle, so there's not much to learn beyond positioning now. Level 88, Enhanced Acceleration. This turns acceleration into a skill with charges. You can now hold two stacks of acceleration. This has more implications than just extra acceleration. Once again, let me emphasize how important it is to use procs as much as you can. But what if you're on a lucky run? Sure, Acceleration works as a swift cast to the Thunder or the Arrow, but you might be losing the proc because you're already sitting on two procs. Instead, we can keep Acceleration on cooldown at all times while holding that second Acceleration. If we have a proc, we don't use Acceleration. But if the cooldown is about to finish on Acceleration and cap us at 2, or if we run out of procs, use Acceleration. This way we don't waste any uses of Acceleration 
but we don't miss out on any potential procs. And as a result, we're using Jolt 2 less and less, with higher consistency on our procs. There's still always going to be times that we run out of procs and acceleration is on cooldown, both stacks. There's always going to be a small luck element, but now it's much more likely we don't get any major starvation as we fight. Level 90, Enhanced Magnification 2, and Resolution. Magnification now has 6 stacks of 5% damage up, because our finisher has gotten longer yet again. Resolution is a final combo hit on top of Scorch. After using Scorch, both Impact and Jolt 2 become Resolution. This is a 750 potency hit, 300 potency for all enemies after the first, and adds 4 mana to black and white. However, this AoE shape is different. This is not a circular AoE on a target. This is a straight line starting from you sent in the direction of the target. This means you need to better position yourself with enemy packs. It's a pretty thick AoE, but if you want to maximize your damage, use the time spent on Verholy slash Verflare and Scorch to find the best position for resolution. Hit as many enemies as you can. In single target? Yeah, just fire it off. You're not going to skip out on a 750 potency hit after doing Scorch. It's kind of an obvious gimme. So let's fit it into the opener and see one other change that happens at the end. Because Resolution takes our rotation just a bit longer, we can do one last dual cast into a final flesh. This Jolt 2 can be replaced with a proc if you get one, but we're not guaranteed a proc here, so do what you can, but make sure to consider this flesh as part of the opener. One other thing I want to point out is why we've been having an open weave window early in the opener that we aren't using. It is because of potion windows. Even if we don't potion here, we're also saving all of our off global cooldowns for after we use Embolden. We want to buff all of those with Embolden, so this empty space here is reserved for potion, but also ensures everything else gets buffed properly. But if you want to get into raiding, that potion window will be extremely useful. So let's sing a very red song of karaoke opener. Bring it on home and don't get too distracted with the constant cutting myself off. Ver Thunder 3. For Arrow 3, Swift Cast, Acceleration. For Thunder 3. For Thunder 3, Embolden. Magnification. Enchanted Repost, Flesh. Enchanted with Show, Country Sixth. Enchanted with Dublin, Core Core. Engagement. For Holy, Core Core. Engagement. Scorch. Resolution. For Fire. For Thunder 3. The Stone. The Arrow 3. Jolt 2. For Thunder 3. Flesh. But that's Red Mage. Fairly simple, but pretty fun. Smooth and flexible, an important utility in the most extreme of emergencies. Thank you for watching this Red Mage 1 to 90 leveling skills guide. Feel free to give feedback or ask questions on what might still be confusing to you. I am always seeking to improve, as should you. Don't stop with this guide, even if I succeeded in helping you improve. Please leave a rating, comment, sub, those really do help creators, or even go follow my Patreon. Have fun in your adventures across Eorzea, and may the power of Anne and Nidhogg slay waste to your enemies.